Hello folks, Dick Fairburn here. Talking about my series in discussing the 1911 pistol, which I feel is the finest, most widely accepted fighting pistol in history. More variations, more being made now than ever before. And today we're going to talk about calibers. 45, of course, was the first. 38 Super, interestingly enough, was the second that Colt chambered. And after that, the most popular defense caliber today, the 9mm Luger. If you want to hear about the various calibers that these pistols have been chambered for, stick around. Okay, first I'm going to talk about the Colt chamberings, and these are more or less in the order in which they appeared in the Colt catalogs. First, of course, 1905, predating the 1911 during the development process, the 45 ACP. That has been chambered in the 1911 by Colt from the beginning to now. So the longest and, and unquestionably the most pistols out there of any ever caliber. This is the traditional US uh, military specifications, originally with a 230 grain full metal jacket at about 830 feet per second. Now we know there are supercharged variations of that now, the 45 Super and the 460 Roland, which I will cover in the non-Colt chamberings because Colt has never made barrels to fit those kind of calibers. So 45 ACP, the first, the most, and surprisingly to me, I, I don't understand how it can, it is almost the most controversial 1911 cartridge out there now. The 9mm fanboys are going to disparage the 45 every chance they get. In 1929, Colt added the 38 Super, which was physically the, exactly the same as the 38 ACP cartridge they had chambered in previous models. The Super just meant it had more pressure and more velocity. And because of that smaller diameter, the higher velocity, it became rather popular in the, in the gangster era because some agencies, some law enforcement agencies, thought it would penetrate better through car glass and car bodies. So 38 Super became rather popular there. 38 Super has always been popular in other countries because in both Mexico and a number of European countries, it is illegal for citizens to own a military cartridge. So they couldn't own the 45, which is for our military. They couldn't own 9mm pistols because 9mm was used by most of the other countries. So the 38 Super was an option for them. And because of that, it, it really is in some ways more popular in other countries than it is here. Today, this round is called the 38 Super Plus P, just to differentiate from the older 38 ACP and make sure that these don't get chambered because physically they, these will chamber in those really antique Colt pistols that are not made for this kind of pressure. Um, I'm going to talk about this later on as we go along. The 38 Super case design was very unusual. It was, it's essentially a revolver style case with, with straight walls and no thickening at the base to help it hold together over the feed ramp. And the 38, like several of other Browning's designs, is a semi-rim. In fact, you can put these in a 38 caliber revolver and fire them, or a 357 caliber revolver. I'm not sure why you would want to, unless that's all you had, but that semi-rim can cause a problem. And I'll discuss that a little bit later when I show you an example of some pistols that I've had build up. The next cartridge to appear in Colt 1911 style pistols is... The 22 long rifle rimfire. This was chambered in, in models that were called either the Ace or the Service Ace, made for the military originally, and then continued on in civilian models for uh, quite a number of years. So there are some out there. In the non-Colt chamberings, of course, there are still a lot of 22s out there, but they do not have the floating chamber 
that was so unique to the uh, Service Ace. The next cartridge was the 9mm Luger. In 1949, the military released a request for proposals looking for smaller, lighter sidearms for officers within the military to be chambered for the 9mm Luger or 9mm Parabellum. That resulted in the development of Colt's Commander. It also generated Smith & Wesson's Model 39. Both of those came out of that 1949 test process. The Army decided not to go that direction. They left uh, the 1911 as the service pistol for uh, military officers. But both Colt and Smith and & Wesson took those developments to market. And in 1950, the Colt Commander, three quarters of an inch shorter slide, and an alloy or aluminum frame to, t to save about a half pound of weight, was chambered in originally the 45, but very shortly, it came out in the 9mm. And Colt has had a, a 1911 chambered for a 9mm, as far as I know, ever since. And the 9mm is growing substantially in popularity with the 1911 recently. And I'm not a 9mm fanboy. I don't think it's the answer to everything, but I like it. And I'll show you that I just had a 1911 set up for the 9mm. I, uh, I think it's a great idea. Ones that I don't have an example of. A 455 Webley. This was made for the British Navy in World War I, a run of Colt pistols for them. And according to my research, a number of uh, these 455 Webley 1911s were also purchased by individual British military officers outside the Navy. The 9mm Steyr, which physically matches the 38 Super in length, or, or the, the newer 9x23. And in fact, uh, in Europe, the 9mm Steyr is known as a 9x23. It is not even remotely as powerful as the Winchester 9x23. A few of these were made for overseas markets because the 9mm Steyr had a fair amount of popularity overseas. The 7.65 Luger, 30 caliber Luger, a few again were made for that overseas market and uh, I do not have any records about whether they were commanders or full 5 inch guns. Colt might be, be able to supply those records but uh, Another interesting one is the 38 Special Wad Cutter Load. In NRA Bullseye Pistol Competition, which is, is sometimes referred to as 2700 because that was the, the total point scores you could make on a, on a course of fire, they have to fire three weapons, three pistols for the aggregate score. They have to fire a 22 rimfire. They have to fire a center fire which is not specified by caliber. And then they had to fire the service pistol, which up and through the bulk of that time was the 45 ACP. And I believe it is now changed to the 9mm as the service pistol. A lot of competitors like the low recoil and accuracy of a 38 special lead wad cutter bullet. And the center fire did not have to be semi-auto. There was, there was no weapon type restriction so a lot of them would shoot 38 revolvers so a 22 generally in a semi-auto a 38 revolver for the wad cutters and then the service load as i said for the bulk of that time service load was the 45 acp and most of them shot a 185 grain jacketed semi wad cutter shape at a reduced velocity so it's kind of a light 45 load and so a lot of competitors said, gee, we'd like to, we'd like to stick with a semi-auto for all of this. So Colt and Smith & Wesson developed pistols to fire that 38 wad cutter. Now it's a rimmed revolver case, so they had to work around that in the design of magazines. There are not a lot of them out there. They were very tightly built in terms of tolerances to give the kind of match grade precision that they needed. Smith & Wesson also developed a 38 wad cutter variation of their 39 pistol, which they called the Model 52. The next cartridge on Colt's list was a variation of that 38 special wad cutter for the same purpose, for that center fire portion of the bullseye matches at Camp Harry. It had the case of the 38 special with the wad cutter bullet, but instead of the 38 rim, they modified the head to be a 38 super semi rimmed case. It was more likely to function well 
and uh, just a lot easier feeding. It was made, to my knowledge, only for the United States Army Marksmanship Unit. And so the name of that cartridge became the 38 AMU. So 38 Special Performance changed the head of the case to semi-rimmed instead of a full rim and things functioned a little bit better. Okay, the next cartridge in the Colt lineup is the 45 HP. Some folks in Europe wanted a 45 caliber 1911, but they were bumping up against that prohibition in their country of having a military cartridge. So the 45 HP was designed. It was one millimeter shorter case length than a 45 ACP. So a 45 ACP would not chamber in there, but it was the same overall loaded length. So basically the ballistics of a 45 ACP with a slightly modified case to make it legal for Europe. Not many were made. The next was Jeff Cooper's design of the 10 millimeter auto. This first came out in the, uh, the Dornhaus and Dixon product called the Bren 10. It was a variation of a CZ-75 design. The pistol and the magazines had problems. Dornhaus eventually went belly up. And both Colt in their Delta Elite and Glock in their Model 20 very quickly chambered the 10 millimeter auto. This is the hottest round ever chambered in a Colt semi-auto pistol. And in the first year of production, they found out that the 10s would crack, and I, I can show you examples here as we go on, of where cracks would develop in the frame because of the, the, the power, the flexing of the frame with this, this hot cartridge. And they had to make a modification to the frame to prevent that. And a lot of pistols today, even non 10 millimeters of all calibers, have that same kind of frame variation. The smaller version of the 10 millimeter, the 40S and W, has been chambered in some Colt pistols. That's a shorter 10 millimeter case. It has, uh, it has a small pistol primer as opposed to a large pistol primer. And uh, that was created to make sure that when you unloaded the pistol, that the primer couldn't be contracted by the, contacted by the extractor and inadvertently fired. So, you know, 40s have shorter case, small primer, lower loading, lower power loading. And in fact, a lot of the 10 millimeters of that era were kind of backloaded to 40 S&W specifications and called a 10 millimeter light or a 10 millimeter FBI. Now we see the advent of those full power 10 millimeters back on the market, mostly being used in, in backcountry self-defense situations against dangerous animals. The last of the cartridges chambered by Colt that I'm aware of, that I can find out so far, is the Winchester 9x23. This is essentially a copy of Jeff Cooper's Super 9 that I will discuss here in a few minutes. It is an extremely strong case in terms of the, the sidewall thickness at the base so that when it goes up the feed ramp of a, of a semi-auto pistol, there's a, you know, no matter how well the pistol is designed, there will always be a, a section of that case unsupported over the feed ramp. 38 Supers were very weak cases, so if you tried to hot rod them, they'd blow out and cause serious problems. Uh, the 9x23 is internally, it's a lot like a 223 rifle case with a 9mm head. It has a very slight taper to it, like a 9mm Luger or 9x19, but it is essentially the same overall dimensions as a 38 Super Plus P. So many of the 1911s that are chambered for the 38 Super will fire the 9x23 and in its full loading it actually exceeds the performance of a 357 Magnum 4 inch throwing 125 grain barrel as fast as 1500 feet per second. So you know in terms of raw energy this is approaching the 10 millimeter power level. The 1911 handles it perfectly well. Okay that brings the Colt chamberings to a grand total of 13 different cartridges, one rim fire, all the rest center fire. What other fighting pistol in the world has ever been chambered for so wide a variety of cartridges to do such a wide variety of tasks? Nothing. You know, even the pistols who were made for the 45, 45 length, you'll see them chambered in 10. A few have been chambered in nine by 23. 
Occasionally you can find a 38 Super in those, but generally most of the fighting pistols in the world were made for the 9mm length cartridge. So what are they going to be chambered for? 9mm or 40. That's basically it. So the 9mm can handle a wide variety of cartridges, uh, and those are the ones that Colt has chambered. Now we're going to widen this out much more. When we look at the kind of chamberings that have occurred in non-Colt brand pistols, so either other manufacturers or custom-built variations, including some Wildcat cartridges that have never been standardized ammunition. Start small, 22 long rifle. Colt is the only company that has produced the floating chamber service ace that will function a 5-inch steel slide on a 1911. But there are many conversion units out there, Kimber, Senior are just a couple that off the top of my head. They generally use a lighter weight slide, either made of aluminum or zinc, and they are a blowback operation. A lot of times the slide is in two segments. One part holds the barrel, the back slide operates to, uh, to function the cartridge feeding. Some of them are very reliable, some of them are very accurate. So a 22 conversion for a 1911 pistol is available from various manufacturers. Another cartridge is the 7.63 Mauser, as opposed to the 30 caliber Luger, this is the 30 caliber Mauser. It's too long to fit in a 9mm size pistol. There have been some of those made probably for overseas sale. The 357 SIG, a bottleneck design, essentially a 40 or 10 millimeter, depending on which case length you're going to talk about, neck down to a 9mm. This approaches or, or equals the power of the 9x23. Both are 357 Magnum revolver level of power. I have never seen a 357 SIG or read of one chambered in a Colt pistol, but a number of other brands uh, have them, and you can get barrels and conversion units anywhere. Another hot 9mm uh, was used as a competitive cartridge for a while when competitors were trying to make major level power factor in USPSA competition with a, a 9 millimeter size bullet uh, until they finally realized that the 38 Super with a better case design and modern powders could give them what they needed. Now with even more modern powders and, and longer barrels they're shooting major power factor with the 9 millimeter but that's also partially because the power factor has been lowered so the, the 9 millimeter can compete with the major calibers. But this is the 9x25 Dillon. Dillon is the uh, reloading press company, the makers of the miniguns. And the 9x25 is a large case built on a 10 millimeter, neck down to 9, to 9 millimeter, longer than a 357 SIG. 45 Super, dimensionally the same as a 45 Auto. Strengthened in the lower part of the case, much like the 9x23 is so that there's no chance of the 45 blowing out over the feed ramp. So 45, higher pressures, higher energy levels. Almost any 1911 chambered for 45 ACP can fire the supers, assuming the barrel is strong enough, and I would say 99.9% .9 of the barrels are strong enough. You may need to add a couple of pounds of recoil spring to, uh, to handle the increased recoil. There's one that's, I, I don't really, know how popular it truly is but it's very popular in a lot of comments I get on on my videos and that's the 460 Roland this this is a slightly longer than 45 ACP case it's I believe it's a 16th inch longer case so that they cannot chamber in a standard 45 barrel power level is uh, greatly increased by high pressure most all of these that I've ever seen have also been fitted with a either a 5 inch or 6 inch barrel and a compensator to handle the recoil and handle the abuse that's coming back into that 1911 action. It's very similar to a 451 Detonix that started making its way around. I don't believe the 451 was ever widely used. There may have been some ammunition made for it at one point. What these things will do is throw that 45 caliber bullet out and give you nearly 44 magnum level performance from a steel 1911 and FNs and HKs and Glocks can also be converted to the 460 Roland. It's kind of interesting to me, but as I go longer in my life, I find that the higher levels of power don't interest me. Be 
because they're so difficult to master. Number one video I have on, on my, my channel at all is uh, Bear Defense Handguns. And the, my subtitle on that is Precision Not Power. You have to hit the brain central nervous system or put some rounds pretty close to those things to deter a charging grizzly or brown bear or even black bear for that matter. So you need precision over power and it, in my experience very few shooters will ever, ever develop the level of precision they need with a 460 Roland or for that matter 44 Magnum revolver or especially the 460 Smith & Wesson or the 500 Smith & Wesson. They're impressive uh, they may be cool and they may be fun, but I see less and less practical use for that kind of power from a handgun. That's just me. I mean, if you think that's what you need, God bless you. It's a free country, barely. Uh, 400 Corbon. This was a 10 millimeter power. It was a neck down 45 case. It was a simple barrel change with a 45 slide. The 50 GI, I know, I know of two people who actually have one of these, so again, I don't know how widespread this is. 50 GI is, is a proprietary case, a 50 caliber bullet. It came out in, uh, in uh, I believe, 2004. You use the 1911 frame, but you need a bigger slide. They also have a conversion for the Glocks, so if you think you need a 50 caliber, they're out there. Kind of going the other way. Uh, there's a 22 TCM, that's a Tuasen Craig Micro Magnum TCM. It is chambered in Rock Island Armory pistols, and it is based on a 223 Remington case neck down to 22 caliber. Performance wise, I'd say it's probably in the same category as a 5.7 by 28. So light, fast bullet, probably very low recoil. I'm not sure the uses that it's good for other than it's kind of cool. Okay, wrapping up our talk on chamberings, and the, again, these are for the non-Colt pistols. There was a 9mm and a 41 Action Express. These were designed by Israeli military industries, I assume. And they were made for a Jericho pistol that was uh, imported into the United States for a while. I had a friend that got a uh, 41 Action Express. He was a 41 revolver guy, so he wanted a semi-auto in 41. But even finding ammo or brass for these cartridges is pretty tough now. I know the 41 Action Ex Express has been fitted up in some nine, 1911 barrels. I'm not certain about the 9mm, which was a, a neck down 41 Action Express. Another 41 cartridge, the 41 Avenger, was invented by J.D. Jones. He's a guy who's invented lots and lots of uh, unique pistol cartridges he, in the days of the uh, Contender single shot for hunting. He invented a number of pretty powerful hunting cartridges for that single shot pistol. He was also the father of the Whisper line of cartridges. The most well known is the 300 Whisper, which is essentially the 300 Blackout. The 300 Blackout was just, a, in, in my opinion, just a blatant copy of the 300 Whisper uh, to avoid paying him royalty fees. And the 41 Avenger was a neck down 45 case. I think that came out in about 1982. Probably the most common of the Wildcats for the 1911 pistol was the 3845. This was developed by Bo Clark at C L E R K E Clark. He uh, wrote for Guns and Ammo magazine back in about 1963. Neck down the 45 auto case to uh, 357 diameter bullets. I, I believe. Uh, it might have been 355s. And gave you approximately the power of a 38 Super that you could just drop a different barrel in your 45 and use that 45 head diameter, but a 9mm 357 size bullet. And there might have been some ammunition made for the 3845 at one time or another, but to my knowledge, that was always a wildcat. You had to make your own brass, you had to load your own ammo. So, 13 in the Colt, 12 that I was able to find in the non-Colt, that's a total of 25 different chamberings for the 1911 pistol. Look at any other fighting pistol in the history of the world. Even the Glock, which is available in, in different sizes, from 22 up to 10 millimeter. With the conversions, you can go to the 460 Roland the same way you can with a 1911 or an FN or a USP. 
if you want to pay your money and get something unique in a 1911-style pistol, you can do it. As big as the 50 GI. How many other pistols in the world can handle that variety of cartridges? None that I know of. In a 100-year-old design that's still in everyday use in the hands of civilians, police officers, and some special military operators. Greatest fighting handgun of all time. But that's just my opinion. Okay, so what can we do with all these calibers? How can we maybe combine several of these calibers into one pistol and give it different missions without having to buy a lot of pistols, own a lot of pistols? Of course, you know, owning a, too many pistols is almost impossible for most of us. So this conglomeration here is a kind of a kit that I have put together over the years. This is a 1911 Colt Commander Lightweight built as a commander in 1952, so it's about three years older than I am. That's pretty old. It came as a 45 ACP. The commander, as I said, was part of a military proposal for a, a smaller, lighter 9mm pistol for military officers. The proposal went nowhere, uh, but both Colt and Smith and & Wesson took their trial pistols for that and marketed them, both as the commander for Colt and is the Model 39 for Smith & Wesson. So this started out as a 45 ACP. It has gone through a couple of different slides over the years. I will show unloaded to make YouTube happy. What I have done with this is to, first of all, branch out into the 38 Super. So it came as a 45. My next change was for 38 Super. In the late 70s, Jeff Cooper tried to hot rod the 38 Super to turn it into a 357 Magnum level semi-auto pistol. And he did that on a lightweight commander frame. And what he found was the 38 Super had a couple of pretty serious design flaws. Uh, one of them is the way it chambered and, and head space. The, the Colt barrels originally, this is the barrel hood, I'll show you some close-ups, they cut a little ledge there for the semi rim of the 38 super case to sat on. So to get the proper headspace it was designed to sit on a little ledge there on the barrel hood. But cartridge cases and chambers have a certain amount of tolerance in them and a lot of times that, that case would slip off of that ledge, deep seat, and that gave very erratic accuracy. So when Cooper had a barrel made by Irv Stone at Barstow Barrels in California, he had it made to headspace on the mouth of the case, which is the way 45s, 9mm, virtually all other semi-auto pistol cartridges work. So the ledge was done away with, it chambered on the mouth. That fixed the accuracy problem. The other problem he quickly found was that the 38 Super or Super Plus P case was essentially a revolver case. It had straight walls that went to the base where the primer mounted in, and they were very weak. And in any semi-auto pistol, you have a feed ramp. Now, in the 1911 design, the feed ramp is partially in the barrel, partially in the frame of the pistol. You are feeding around that sits rather low compared to the barrel in the magazine, so it needs to go up that feed ramp, hit the top of the chamber, double deflection, and then fit into the chamber. So you need a little bit of tolerance there. And when you have that amount of tolerance, a certain part of the bottom of the case is not going to be supported by steel, that, that cut over the feed ramp. The 38 Super case was so weak that when you tried to hot rod it, that weak, thin brass wall would blow out. And when you blow out 20 or 30,000 PSI of powder gases down into the action of a pistol, it is exciting. I can tell you that firsthand because I have blown two cases in this pistol. Because it's a metal frame made out of aluminum, what it typically happens is the magazine will be blown out and often will be wrecked. If you have wood grips on there, which I did the first time it blew, um, they will be split and put splinters in your hand. It feels like the frame got about that big and then shrank down instantly and I, the only thing I can compare it to is hitting a really fast thrown hardball with a wooden bat. 
that, that buzz, that sting in your hand is substantial. Now, we have seen these happen with bad ammo in pistols like a Glock with a plastic or polymer frame. And when that happens, when you blow out a case in one of those, you typically will blow a chunk out the side of that, that frame. And you need a new frame. But these held up. But blowing cases is, is a bad deal all around. So, Major George Nanti was a retired Army Ordnance guy. He wrote for Shooting Times magazine over in Peoria, not too far from where I'm sitting, many moons ago. And he told Cooper, he said, you know, the 38 Super is a weak case design. He said, cut 223 rifle brass. The head diameter is just slightly different. You're going to have to fiddle with the extractor to make sure it pulls it out. But if you cut it off to the length of a 38 Super case and use your 9 five, or your uh, your 9 millimeter or 355 diameter bullets in that, it is so much stronger at the base of the case, you're not going to blow out. Now Cooper's barrel and his lightweight commander was a six inch, six, six and a half, I think a six and a half. So it stuck out to about here, out of the slide of that lightweight commander. But he was going for maximum velocity in a, in a test pistol to see what could be done. Well, what could be done was 90 grain hollow points at about 2,000 feet per second. That's at or well beyond a 4 inch 357 Magnum revolver. And he called it the, the Super 9. Some people called it the Super Cooper. It was written up in Guns and Ammo magazine. I thought that was really cool. My pistol smith buddy, Dick Heine, thought that was really cool. So we bought a 38 Super Slide. He fitted it up on my 45 lightweight frame. We got a 38 Super Barrel made by Herb Stone at Barstow Barrels. Chambers on the mouth. And with using that 223 rifle brass, now mine was a standard length. While Cooper's Barrel was out to here, mine was a standard. I got 115 grain hollow points up, well, well, let's just say in the vicinity of 1,700 feet per second with loads that I thought were safe. What I had to do to get those kind of velocities was the typical pistol powders of, of Unique and Herco and things like that. They wouldn't give me those kind of velocities. You run out of room. You just couldn't get enough powder in there. So I started trying some ball powders that were not... There was, there was no pistol load data for them, and that was Winchester 540, Winchester 571. They were made for heavy shotgun loading. And 30 years later, I found out that I could have bought those over the counter as pistol powders from Hodgton because they sold 540 under the name of HS6, still do to this day. They sold 571 under the name of HS7, which has been discontinued by both Winchester and Hodgton. And the denser ball powders allowed me to get more in there with slower powders that still gave safe pressures. And we got some really screaming loads. I wrote an article for Handloader Magazine at the time about, you know, supercharging the 38 Super. And Dick Heine thinks that that article in Handloader showing people how to get horsepower out of that 38 Super case started the 38 Super craze in USPSA competitive pistol shooting. You know, in, in that discipline, uh, when Cooper invented that, he had two scoring systems, depending on whether your cartridge was major, like a 45, or minor, like a 9mm Luger. People wanted something smaller than a 45 for lighter recoil, but they wanted that major scoring advantage. And they could not get it with a 9mm at any kind of safe pressures. But when I showed them it was possible to do it in 38 Super, using the 223 rifle brass, that kind of sparked an idea. And eventually the 38 Super case was completely changed. Starline makes these. This is called a, a uh, 38 Super Comp. It's a much stronger case design, so it will hold those higher pressures. And the biggest, really the biggest advantage in the 38 Super for USPSA competition was everybody was going to compensated pistols now for the unlimited class. And compensators are more efficient in a high pressure case than they are in a low pressure case. So while a compensated 45 helped quite a bit in terms of recoil and muzzle rise, doing it in a 38 Super with, you know, 40,000 pounds of pressure instead of 20,000 pounds of pressure made it even more efficient. So that was a lot of what drove the 38 Super. Uh, since then, USPSA has dropped the power floor for Major by, I believe, 5,000 units. 
And now a good hot loaded 9mm with some of the modern powders can make major. So the 38 Super is probably, you know, dying back quite a bit. I was living in Wyoming. This was going to be a great trail gun. And essentially carrying a 357 Magnum revolver load in a pistol that was a half pound or more lighter would hold 10 rounds in the magazine plus one in the chamber. This was cool. So that's my 38 Super, and unfortunately that 38 Super slide and barrel assembly and recoil spring, and you do need to change the slide stop. 38 Super 9mm uses a different slide stop than a 45. It just languished. Uh, it's set in the, the vault most of the time. But recently, based on improvements in all calibers, the 9mm is, in my opinion, a viable self-defense caliber. And 9mm ammo is about the cheapest center fire load you can get out there. So I took my 38 Super rig back to Mr. Heine and I said, put a 9mm barrel in there. And I was originally going to get some 9mm magazines for it, but then I find, he said, you don't need to do that. He said, they'll feed just fine out of a 38 Super magazine. So with two slides, three barrels, a little bit lighter spring for the 9mm as opposed to the 38 Super, I've got two slide stops. I've got a kit here. 38 Super 9mm magazines, 45 magazines, and the thing about the 38 Super is the latest version of this hot 9mm round was Winchester's 9x23. This was made to be a major power cartridge for USPSA competition and a heck of a self-defense round too, really. The 9x23, the inside of the case, when you section them, it really almost looks like a 223 rifle case. But it has the overall dimensions almost exactly of the 38 Super. It has a 9mm breech face, and they fit perfectly in most 38 Super barrels. Unless, unless that barrel is, is, has really, really tight tolerances, you can fire the 9x23 in a 38 Super. So you got four calibers. You got nine, uh, 45 ACP, 38 Super, which, to my notion, today when I load for this pistol, I'm going to load 9x23s because they're hotter yet. And an even stronger case or by swapping the barrel and the recoil spring i can shoot cheap nine millimeter ammo in there with a 45 i got eight rounds if i want to carry this for bear defense out in wyoming if i get some hard cast bullets from underwood uh, bear tooth bullets some of those kind of boutique loaders there's no reason that lightweight commander wouldn't do a fine job drive in deep enough if i can make the shots well enough to stop a bear or I can go with a 9x23 and I've got a really neat little trail gun for places where I'm not concerned about big foul smelling bears trying to cause me a problem. That shows the versatility of the 1911 design. It can take longer rounds than those only built for a 9mm so that opens up the 45, the 10mm, the 38 Super, the 9x23. It can take 9 as well. There are 40 caliber 1911s out there. I have dealt with several of them over the years and I personally would not recommend the 40 in the 1911 design. There's something about the geometry of the, the 10 millimeter size case but shorter than the 10 millimeter. They just don't feed really well. Now I'm sure if you tinker with them long enough you can get it figured out. So if you've got a 40 and you're happy with it, God bless you. But I wouldn't recommend someone start out with a 40 because you may have to invest time and money to get it to do what you want. Just get a 10 millimeter. And if you're worried about the power level, get some lighter loads. So that's the 1911. In terms of the calibers that it's been chambered for, 25 that I can, uh, um, that I can come up with from both Colt and non-Colt manufacturers, there are probably more. If you know of a cartridge, even if it's a wildcat that you invented for yourself, hey, put it in the comments and let me know. The comments from the first two videos where I talked about the variations of pistols, I've had three different people write into me and tell me that there was a military variation I didn't know of. I not I haven't found anybody other than these guys who knew of it. And they told me that prior to the M9, the, the Beretta being adopted as a military pistol, the Air Force took a number of 5-inch 1911A1 guns, they cut the slide and barrel back to around 4 inches, they cut the frame off a little bit shorter, losing one round in the magazine capacity. So it's really an officer's length frame, probably before Colt even made the officer's model pistol. 
uh, still chambered for 45, and they were issued to agents of the Office of Strategic Investigation. So OSI agents got these custom-built Air Force pistols. And interestingly, one guy said the one he was issued was a U.S. switch and signal, which is one of the rarer variations of the 1911A1. And one guy said he heard that a couple were singers, which is, which is the, the holy grail of buying a 1911A1 is to find a singer. So I put some feelers out. Hopefully I can find some more information about these OSI guns. I'd love to, to see one, get my hands on it, or, or just get a photo of one. So if you know of calibers that are beyond my list, by all means, put them in the comments. Folks, if you like these videos, give me a subscription, ring the little bell, give me a thumbs up, and comments. I love to read the comments. If you disagree with me, that's fine. You know, it's a free country. We'll argue all we want. But uh, thank you for watching this video clear to the end. My next one is going to talk about my thoughts on what you need for features of a 1911 for the perfect carry gun nowadays. Okay? We, don't, we need a commander hammer and a beaver tail grip frame. Why? Because if you've got that old style 1911, 1911A1 hammer and grip safety, it's going to bite you. So sights, trigger, hammer, ruffling up the front surface. I'll talk about all the, the variations that I think you need on a good carry pistol. And there was a day when that had to be built by a custom pistol smith. Now you can get those features over the counter. And um, that'll be the next video. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Okay, we got them both here now. You ready? Bud got one. Ginger got one. Uh-huh. Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl. Last one. Ready? You ready? Yeah. That's all there is till next time.